Hi, my name is Andy Gillies. I'm a freelance interpreter and interpreter trainer. And I've been asked to say uh, something about how we can do consecutive without notes or from memory uh, in this film today. Why might we want to do notes? Uh, why might we want to do consecutive without notes? Well, first of all, you have admissions tests to the interpreting schools. Very often, doing a short speech of two or three minutes without notes is part of those tests. And secondly, very often the first three or four months of the course will involve doing consecutive, but not taking notes. At one and the same time, I and other uh, trainers have noticed that often students are asked to do these consecutive without notes but they're not actually given any instructions as to how to do it. So in today's film, I'd like to do two things. First of all, uh, give you a few ideas as to how you can listen uh, so that you can do consecutive without notes. And in doing that, demonstrate that it's not you personally that has a good or bad memory, but rather that if you use your memory correctly, then you can remember an awful lot. And that in turn, will later mean that we have less reliance on notes in consecutive when we do eventually come to take notes. But let me first of all just say something quickly about memory itself and um, I'm basing myself a little bit here on uh, an excellent passage in um, Robin Seton and Andrew Darrant's fantastic book about conference interpreting called Conference Interpreting. And they describe three types of memory for the purposes of consecutive interpreting. The first is echoic memory, the second is working memory, and the third is long-term memory. Let me just say a little bit more about those. So echoic memory is basically when you hear a sound and that phonetic sound just resonates in your mind or your ear for a few seconds. Usually we would associate that with proper names or with numbers. They just we can hear them and we have to do something with them. Sometimes we write them straight down onto the notepad without really thinking about what they mean. Alternatively, we do nothing with them and they very quickly disappear and get forgotten. And then the other thing that you can do with something that is echoing around in echoic memory is send it to your working memory. And working memory is where, is where all the, the hard work happens. Uh, in the brain. We put things together, we work out what they mean, what the message behind them is. And again, with working memory, once information is in there, there are two things, or three things that we can do with it. One, nothing and it gets forgotten. Two, put it into our notes for recall later. Or three, process it so that it then moves into long-term memory and that we can remember it much later. Uh, there's a diagram on the screen here just to show you uh, briefly how that might look if you wanted to create a schematic out of it. The diagram also shows, of course, that general knowledge plays an important part, both in working memory and long-term memory. If you know something already, it takes up less of your working memory to process something. And if you know something already, it's already in your long-term memory, so it doesn't need to be added to it. But that's not, general knowledge is not really the subject of today's film, so I won't go into that, but do keep it in mind. So I wanted to describe to you four, um, maybe five, memory prompts that can help you to uh, listen to a speech and remember it. The first is a narrative prompt, the second will be a visual prompt, the third a structural prompt, the fourth a logical prompt, and the fifth is notes, but notes obviously are not the subject of today's film. So we'll just look at those first four. Um, and what I'm going to suggest is that by deciding in advance of listening to a speech how you're going to listen to it and use one of these tools, you can remember a great deal of the speech. So let's first look at the narrative uh, tool. That basically means stories. If you watch a film or you read a book, it's no problem at all to tell somebody about the plot of that film 10, 15 minutes, a couple of days later, you can remember it very easily. The human brain is geared to remember stories and so we can benefit from that as consecutive interpreters. I can give you a very good example. Um, if you look at the Steve Jobs commencement speech uh, that I've shown you a, a screenshot of on uh, the screen at the moment, you'll actually see that 
it's made up of three five-minute stories. Try listening to one of them and you'll see that knowing in advance that it's a story and listening to it as a story means that you can remember almost all of the detail without any notes at all. Now, in practice, of course, whole speeches aren't just one story, but we'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. Next, visual prompts. It's very easy to link information to something that you can actually see. Now that might be a picture or an actual object. Let me give you an example of what I mean. If you, uh, you can see on the screen at the moment a, a self-driving car. And I just want to talk to you about the glass dome on the roof. In that glass dome, there is a LiDAR camera. It's made up of either 32 or 64 lasers, which revolve around the car and detect objects and measure their sizes in a range of anything between 60 and 200 meters. And that then creates for the car's computer a 3D map of the surroundings. And the software in the car's computer will then classify the objects by their size, their shape, and their movement patterns. It's very technical, and at the moment, it's very expensive. It costs about $70,000. Okay, so I've just given you about one minute's information about that one part of the picture. If you were now to stop this film and try and remember what I said, you'd be able to, just because the car is in front of you and you're associating that information with the dome on the roof. Now, I can do the same with five other parts of the car, as indicated by the arrows in the picture, and you would then have five times one minute of information, a five minute speech, quite technical, quite difficult, which you could remember very, very well. This is particularly useful in, con in consecutive interpreting because very often we are actually in front of the object that's being talked about. It might be a landscape, a building, a machine, or just a PowerPoint slide, but we can see the thing and we can associate information to the picture. And it's a very powerful tool for remembering things. Another thing that's also very interesting is that interpreters generally teach that we should write down things like numbers and dates. Uh, what you'll notice is that it's actually very, e very easy to remember even numbers and technical details like that from the information that's associated with a picture, even without notes. Ask yourself, how many cameras are there in the LiDAR radar? How much did the LiDAR radar cost? I bet you can still remember. Sometimes we aren't actually in front of a picture of something we can see and that's being talked about. But in those situations, we can visualize in the mind's eye a picture of our own and the technique is just as, um, just as powerful. Uh, a little aside, in Aik's very interesting book about the beginning of the conference interpreting of profession, uh, La naissance d'une profession, there's a passage in which uh, one of the authors asks in 1950, Andre Kaminka, a very famous pre-war interpreter, how it was that he could possibly remember 30 or 40 minutes of speech without notes. And Kaminka replies, in, basically, he uses a visual memory technique to do it. I won't go into that here, but that's how at least one of those great interpreters managed to do such long consecutives by adapting this technique. Okay, number three. We can remember things based on uh, structural prompts. So before you listen to a speech, say to yourself, okay, I'm going to split this speech up into its main parts. It might be three, it might be five. It's a very famous old interpreting exercise to count the parts of a speech on your fingers. And you can do exactly that. Uh, if you want a variation on the same technique, you can assign a word to each of the parts of the speech and that too will help you remember the rest of the detail. What's really happening here is in deciding on a part or a word of the speech, you're processing the speech and that processing transfers the information from your working memory to your long-term memory. So it's the thinking about it, the processing, that sends it to long-term memory. And just saying that a speech has four parts or five parts can help you remember a great deal of any given speech. Uh, the fourth memory prompt is the logical prompt. 
This is what Seleskovich called latent memory, but what many people have since called uh, the red thread, which has been borrowed from French fil rouge, which itself is a calc from the German rote Faden, where the expression actually exists, and it means the logical thread running through a speech. So as you listen to a speech, you ask yourself questions. Why did they do that? Who are they doing that with? When did they do that? What, did, what happened after that? You continue asking yourself these questions as you listen uh, to the speech and answering the questions, obviously, at the same time. And then when you come back, you start at the beginning of the speech and in your subconscious, you ask yourself these questions again. And it, the fact of asking these questions drags the information out of your latent memory, as Seleskovich uh, called it. And you'll find that actually almost all of the information from the speech is still there and can be recalled if you ask yourself these prompting questions. There's an interesting variety, uh, variation on this exercise. You can actually start at the end of the speech and work backwards to the front, and uh, it still works. Now, I hear you say, OK, but speeches aren't always just a story or just a picture or just a logical thread. And that's absolutely true. So where these tools become very powerful is when we combine them. As you listen to the speech, you can choose which technique to apply to which part of the speech and combine them. So for example, you say, OK, I'm going to break this speech into a structure of five parts. The first part is an image, the second part is a story, the third part is another story. And that will work more powerfully than one of the techniques alone. The Steve Jobs speech that I, I mentioned a moment ago is a, is a great example of this. It's essentially a speech in five parts, an introduction, three stories, and a conclusion. And if you listen to the speech in that way, you can remember it's a 15-minute speech and you'll have no trouble remembering almost all of it. So you can apply one, one prompt to each part of the speech and combine in that way. There's another way of combining, which is to combine two or more prompts in a single part of the speech. So for example, if you decide that this part of the speech is a story, you can obviously also visualize the story. Or you can say to yourself, this story is very logical, it flows. And you can, you can deal with it as a story and a logical progression um, at the same time. So when we, when we combine these four tools, they become even more uh, powerful. So I hope you can go away and practice now with a bit more confidence about how good your memory can be. Uh, you'll have to experiment, see what works best for you. Not everyone has a visual memory. Not everyone might like the logical approach. But I hope I've shown you that your memory can be very, very powerful. And that will give you the confidence when you come to take notes not to over-rely on those notes. And altogether, that should make for great consecutive.